Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Rowan von Spreckelsen, Head of New Markets across APAC. I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion, which is going to be focused on Japan's recently unveiled green subsidy program, the draft Green Transformation Act, published in February and passed into law in May by the Japanese parliament. Today's guest is Hitomi Komachi, a partner at Allen and Overy's Tokyo office. She is an English law qualified lawyer based in Japan and has extensive experience in clean energy projects and the broader energy transition field. Hitomi is an expert in the international legal landscape and government policies impacting key Japanese and international industry players. On that note, hot off the press is the news that Allen and Overy has recently advised the lenders on the first project financing of a hydrogen project called Helios in Neom, Saudi Arabia. And so we're keen to also hear a bit about that, as well as the broader topic material around the GX Act. Welcome, Hitomi. Thanks very much. Glad to be here. We're also joined today by Hayata Ono. Aurora's head of advisory in Japan, who's going to chat to Hitomi with me. Welcome, Hayato. Hello, thanks for having me. Excellent. So to start off with, I think it's worth just setting the context for the conversation. And a lot of our listeners will be familiar with the US's Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the European Repower EU Act, but won't necessarily be as familiar with Japan's Green Transformation Act or, or GX Act that, that passed into law earlier this year. The act generally aims to accelerate decarbonization in Japan and to achieve its goal of cutting 46% of Japan's carbon emissions by the turn of the decade relative to 2013 levels, and ultimately to make Japan carbon neutral by 2050. Hitomi, could you maybe give us a bit of an overview of of why the act is such a big deal and and what the kind of key three or four or five points are? Like, what, What technologies is it trying to incentivize? What are the mechanisms that the act is is using, and what's the potential size in in in, in yen and, and dollars? Sure, happy to set the scene first. So in February, the Japanese cabinet approves the basic policy for achieving green transformation, or the GX base basic policy. And based on that, the act on promoting a smooth transition to a decarbonized, grow, growth oriented economic structure or the so-called GX Act, was enacted on May 12th. And the GX Act is to be promulgated in the new future and will take effect within three months after its promulgation. So overall, the package is a 20 trillion yen government funding commitment to unlock 150 trillion yen of investment over the next 10 years. In U.S. dollars, that's a $150 billion government funding package and $1.1 trillion of investment to be unlocked over the next 10 years. So when we just talk about the size, I mean, it's it's a significant government funding, which immediately attracted a lot of attention. It's about half of what the U.S. has committed already under the IRA. But in terms of the economic effect on investment that it's trying to unlock, actually, the Japanese package is aiming for three times the impact of the IRA. Um, And hopefully I can unpick a a couple of of the reasons why later on when we get into the the details of of the scheme. But just to talk a bit more about the general sort of overview, the act seeks to incentivize sectors and technology that promote energy security competition and decarbonization at the same time in and outside of Japan, including renewable power, nuclear power, hydrogen, ammonia, CCS, battery supply chain, sustainable aviation fuel, marine fuel, e-methane, and many others. And that alone is in the energy sector, but it's also trying to you know, accommodate AI and, and technology innovation in, in general. A new entity called the GX Promotion Executive Committee, has been established and the organization will collect fossil fuel import and emission charges that will be charged to support support this funding package. So 
that the way that the government is planning to raise the $150 billion is through their government bond issuances over the course of the next 10 years. It's trying to repay that over the course of that period and beyond through obtaining fossil fuel import charges and emission charges that will be imposed on the power generators in Japan. So it's really ambitious and comprehensive, as you see. There's plenty of things to work out. But personally, I'm really encouraged by this by this act. We should recognize the fact that it's got the scale and the and and to have a real impact, not just in Japan, but globally. And it has carrots and sticks, which certainly required to make progress on energy transition, just transition and decarbonization as a whole. Four years ago, I was sitting in a uh, with clients in 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 their at their offices, wishing for something like this. And to us, it's sort of like it's finally here. We're we excited about it. We want to work with it. And we want to make sure it's a success for everyone. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And I, I mean, it is a hugely wide-reaching scope. And as you say, that the 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 yen and, and dollar amounts are, are, are huge. Now that it's actually been enacted, what are, what are some of the major kind of challenges of delivery of, of such a wide, wide-ranging scope and, and act itself? Yeah, sure. Yeah, the flip side of having such a wide-ranging and, you know, aiming to be a comprehensive package is, of course, how we allocate then the funding commitments across the many purposes. And what has come out, you know, quite prominently is the hydrogen and ammonia CFD scheme, which we can talk about a bit more detail that's got um, $60 billion of, of sort of allocation together with other hydrogen and ammonia funding schemes. CCS will will get around $30 billion, but we don't know how those funding you know, buckets will work with each other because, of course, Japan is looking at blue hydrogen and ammonia. So, you know, there may be some overlap between the CCS funding and the, and the hydrogen and ammonia CFD scheme. We don't know. So th- there is a lot more to be worked out in terms of how the funding is going to be allocated. The other thing is that Japan only has a voluntary carbon market so far, and establishing a carbon pricing and a carbon market is is key to to the stick side of the of the package. And the the current plan is that the charges to be imposed on the power generators and importers of fossil fuel uh, will be set around 2025, 2026, that kind of time frame. But at the same time, in order to signal to the investment community what the cost is going to be of using fossil fuel, the earlier we can you know, put out that signal, the better, so that people can start modeling it to see what the impact is and to really see the, the, the benefit of energy transition investment as a whole. And so, you know, I know that it's mo- that one of the most challenging pieces to be worked out in Japan because of the lack of, you know, cap and trade system like we see in EU and other places. But that's a really important piece that the government should be really focused on, in my view. You mentioned the hydrogen and ammonia part of the scheme there. I was recently at a APAC hydrogen conference where this, this, this support for the whole hydrogen supply chain was creating a huge amount of interest and, and, and optimism generally, in large part because some of that money is, is targeted domestically, but also allowing money for clean hydrogen and ammonia production that is done overseas as long as that offtake and, and, and transport is shipped back to Japan. Can you maybe go into a bit more detail on what that looks like? It seems like it's potentially a, a, a huge, a huge deal for for exporting countries like like hydro, like Australia, for example, or some other regions and, and markets where you might see that that having a large impact. Yeah, sure. So, as a firm, is we're we're working on more than fourteen international hydrogen and ammonia supply chain projects, and they span across North America, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and Asia. In terms of green. Hydrogen, the key exporter countries, as you mentioned, are Australia and some of the other countries that have cheap renewable power, both solar and wind, like in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, of course, UAE, other places, Chile and other countries in Latin America and and other parts of US are also tutored to be big green hydrogen exporters. 
Japan's also looking at blue hydrogen. And so that is anywhere with gas reserves, really, if we can make CCS happen. And you already mentioned that Helios project financing, the first project financing of its, of its kind of a hydrogen, a green hydrogen project in Saudi Arabia, that didn't have Japanese interest on the equity side, some on the, on the financing side, but not on equity. And so, I mean, firstly, for the skeptics out there, it is, it is happening and investment will happen in this space, even without the, the GX Act. But as you say, Japan's GX Act really puts the sector on another level because that is seeking to unfold Japan as the next big destination market um, for hydrogen and ammonia. But not only that, the act does target international supply chain projects. So I mentioned the $60 billion commitment of the government. The, the two main schemes that the government is working on to distribute that funding is one through the cluster support where, where they will fund the projects domestically for the transport, storage, and usage of cleaner hydrogen and ammonia. And the other bucket, by far the bigger bu- bucket, when we look at the capex of this, is the international supply chain project where we're looking at, you know, the renew- the upstream side of hydrogen and ammonia, like renewable energy production or the natural gas biomethane or biomass upstream project, the electricity transport, the water supply, and on the blue side, the, the, the CCS, and, and then the hydrogen production, either green or blue. And then importantly for Japan, there's also conversion for the purposes of transport. So if it's going to be liquefied, the li- liquid section process, the conversion to ammonia, if it's going to be transported by means of ammonia, and then marine transport, so bringing that back to Japan and importing it and reconverting it into hydrogen or the medium in which it will be used in Japan. All of the, these components is being targeted by the supply chain subsidy scheme. Uh, so that that's going to that's basically quite a bespoke subsidy scheme when we look at it across the the, the globe. You know, the EU the EU members and and UK have their own subsidy schemes, but targeting mainly mainly domestic hydrogen ammonia projects, with the exception of Germany that has H2 Global, which is also targeting limited supply chain projects for Germany. But aside for, from Germany, Japan is probably the only other major country with a subsidy scheme aimed at international supply chains of this scale. Yeah, and I think it's done an excellent job of positioning it itself with it as the, as the importer of choice across APAC specifically because of that and, and essentially creating a lot of competition for exporting countries, particularly those that have, that have historically exported a lot of fossil fuels looking to transition the, those parts of their economies long term and, and, and remain relevant. Maybe stepping back a little bit from the, the hydrogen side of the, of the act and putting a little bit more back into kind of its general context. I mean, Japan as a whole has kind of obviously high population density, very mountainous regions, limited resource, therefore, beyond a certain point for onshore and offshore renewables, for example. What are, what are some of the kind of unique points with regards to the GX Act and how that differs from other schemes like the US's IRA or some of Europe's schemes, for example? How much of that is influenced by the challenges that are so specific to Japan in terms of its power generation and, and natural resources? Yeah, great question. And when we look at how the Japanese government has been approaching the GX Act, it's it's very interesting because they're, they were kind of sitting back as the EU package was being announced, the American package was being announced, comparing very carefully what was being done you know, on both ends. And then really looking at its own needs and tailoring the, the GX Act specifically for, for, for Japan's needs. So for, for example, Japan is in a very sort of, it's got its own needs that's very different from, from other countries. It's dependent, it's heavily dependent on coal and LNG import as of now to generate more than a thousand terawatts per hour per year of electricity and being an island country with very limited land available for further renewable power and production, 
it's launched a 30 to 40 gigawatt offshore wind program, but it's, it's only really starting to do so. And so when we look at the net zero target that Japan has announced, like many other countries, as well as the, the significant reduction of carbon emission and that it's committed to do by 2030, effectively, it's coming to a conclusion that renewable power isn't enough, isn't sufficient, both for in terms of the production amount that is achievable in such a short span of time, as well as the, the, the stability, the issues of, of renewable power and the grid issues that Japan has to accommodate gigawatts and gigawatts of renewable power. Now, on hydrogen and ammonia, it's only going to be at 1% of the power mix, but it's an important one because the, the history of Japan looking at that and being the major importer of LNG now, you know, it sees itself as a pioneer in the LNG industry. And it also sees itself as a pioneer in the hydrogen and ammonia sphere if we can have that sort of the technology advancement that we need in order to replace hydrogen, uh, in, or, in order to replace gas-fired and coal-fired power plants with potentially hydrogen-powered and ammonia-powered power plants. And in doing so, actually creating a hydrogen and ammonia society that has wider implications on transport, you know, so creating a, an e-methanol market, creating a sustainable aviation fuel market. So it, it's sort of trying to transform the power sector, but in doing that, allowing other sort of sectors to flourish, bo both from the sort of economic standpoint, but also from the decarbonization perspective. One area, of course, also is green steel, where, you know, coal-fired blast furnaces will, should be replaced or can be replaced by hydrogen if we, if we can make clean hydrogen happen. But going back to that conversation I was having with clients four years ago, Clearly, for Japan, if we don't transform the power sector, we can't make the demand market happen for, for all of these sectors in manufacturing, trans transport, and aviation. And that's the important lesson that Japan has learned over the past you know, few years or since it's basically first launched its hydrogen strategy back in 2017. Yeah, I mean, it mean, makes a lot of sense. I mean, every... Every country's energy policy is always going to be shaped by its its natural resources, and obviously, it's got a Japan's got an understandably strong focus as an as an importer on ensuring that stability of of global supply chains whilst maintaining that position as a technology leader. And I think that role that you were talking about with regards to one percent of the power mix, but as a critical component of that firming, which is very much a function of. Is it a wind? Is Japan going to be long term a wind heavy system or a solar heavy system? And what's the role of firming in those slightly different different markets? And there'll be a geographical diversity across Japan between solar heavy south and and, and wind heavy north potentially. But long term, that decarbonized firming capacity, whether it's hydrogen or ammonia, will, will play a large role. Just to kind of pivot slightly, well, I mean, we we touched briefly on the US Inflation Reduction Act a, a couple of times, but I wanted to dive in in a bit more detail and maybe do a bit of a direct comparison between the GX Act and, and the IRA. You, you mentioned previously about the, the size that it's looking to unlock. What, what's, your, what's your view on the, on the two different acts and from the kind of conversations that you're having across the industry, what are the pros and cons from the perspective of, of the Japanese domestic players, but also the international players looking at both markets? Where, where are we seeing capital going to flow? Yeah, sure. I think when we really sort of analyze and boil down the two schemes, I think it's a different, the difference between variable subsidy and fixed subsidy, where in very simple terms, the IRA is tax-linked subsidy, both in terms of production tax incentive and investment tax credits, where they have said, if you're producing a clean product, you know, and depending on how much emission that is being saved on a sliding scale, you will get this much incentive and it's fixed and it's very clear. And the advantage of that is that the, the, the simplicity, right? And it's just an easy thing to model. 
And that's obviously very attractive to investors around the world and is attracting loads and loads of investment, you know, from everywhere. And it's also even sort of, we're also seeing kind of offshoot investments sort of upstream of that, for example, in the mining sector, you know, in order to take advantage of the, the IRA and investments in the US, we need to sort of, you know, do mining activities elsewhere and then bring it into the US. So I think indirectly, some of the other countries are also seeing a, an uptick in, in, in investments that way. Other countries like Japan, UK, Netherlands have gone the other way of the variable subsidy model where the government is trying to subsidize difference between what is the price today and the bid price that the the producers and bidders will compete for and say, you know, this is going to be the, that realistically, this is going to be the price that we can produce green products. And uh, that's effectively the CFD or cost for difference model uh, that we have seen in Europe has been very successful at doing this in the offshore wind sector, for instance. But it, even its precursor, the FIT scheme, you know, I've seen that the, the renewable power boom in 2010s um, and so on, hugely successful. And that led to the, the big renewable power boom back then as well. And um, I guess from the, the, the policy perspective, what is important, what's driving the variable model is really the government's sort of attention to the production cost. Particularly, the Japanese government is, it cares because as an importer, as you said, you know, it's all about the perspective. But from Japan's perspective, as an importer, the production cost is very important. So they don't just look at, fine, we just want to fund all these green products and we just want to, you know, sort of make sure these green products are going everywhere. They're, li- they're thinking long-term supply and long-term energy security for Japan. We want to drive down the cost of producing say green and blue hydrogen. So they wanted a scheme that introduces competition. And so it's quite interesting because you can do auction system fixed subsidy scheme, right? But that's not seen in IRA and it's not seen in the US. That's why you see this rush of investment saying, okay, we just go there and produce and sell. And that's all you need to do in order to gain advantage. But you could, you could, you know, have an auction in that system as well and have that sort of level of check, you know, on, on the production cost or the quality of the production, let's say. But at least when you have a variable subsidy model, you know, you, you already, you automatically have that through the auction system of this bid price. I think the, in my view, the, 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 the variable model is challenging though in hydrogen and ammonia because we don't have the market for green hydrogen and ammonia. It's, it's very different from offshore winds and renewable power where we have electricity market and you know, ongoing electricity, existing electricity price. We don't have that here in hydrogen and ammonia and the, and the price will also vary depending on its use case. So I mentioned power is very important for Japan, but you know, also like marine and transport and manufacturing use is also, also important too, and the price will vary. So that, that's the cha- challenge with the variable, variable model. But the, the, the government sort of, I'm sure they have looked at all these different models and have come up with, you know, the, the best way to, to, to do this. And we'll see what basically comes out in the, in the scheme that is announced later this year. And with that, the first bids for hydrogen and ammonia coming up in the middle of next year. It is, it is interesting having the, the, the comparison across the two schemes, I think. And the way that the, the Japanese scheme is designed with regards to that, that contract for difference based on what your production cost is to a certain extent it doesn't doesn't actually preclude you from doubling up on capturing if you're producing in the US and and picking up the the IRA subsidy on the production side from still inc- incorporating the, the the Japanese subsidy into the whole supply chain but the variable nature of it means that you're not just adding collectively you're having to factor in your reduced production cost in the US which still might kind of advantage the whole the whole supply chain but it's it's not a kind of pure double dip it's but it's it's allowing two sets of government subsidies to to support the industry in their in their own way but not over not overspend collectively 
Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting point because the government has said that they would like to avoid double dipping, but because these schemes are very different. So exactly how you set about doing that is is interesting. Like the CFD scheme, and we can get into the mechanics of it, but is you bid a price, but that price will take into account CapEx, OpEx, and IRR for that bidder. So if you're that if you're producing that amount in the US, how do you actually subtract? And the and Japan has also said that, you know, it's not an exclusive thing. So you can you can, you know, have US produced American hydrogen ammonia and bring it back to Japan and 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 take advantage of the scheme, but it's just that they need to avoid double dipping. So how it would be really interesting to see the details of how they actually subtract the IRA subsidy mm. from and how you, how they actually analyze that in the auction context will be will be really interesting to see. Yeah. 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 No, exactly. Hey, Otto, I might I might bring you in at this point, just kind of on in the context of the kind of Japanese power sector specifically. I, as I know, I, I know you and the Aurora team spend a lot of time tracking this, particularly with regards to how it's going to affect the power sector. The if we see a wave of hydrogen and ammonia entering the market. Um, to what extent do you think the act more broadly or the scale and scope of the act has been driven by the decarbonization goals in, in Japan versus more of a kind of reaction to recent high and volatile gas prices, in the example, pushing up, pushing up power prices? Or is it, or is it a bit of both? Yes, so under the current Kishida administration, the GX working group was established last July. So that's about five months after the Russia-Ukraine conflict began. So in that sense, high and volatile commodity prices, including gas, could have had influence on the current administration of pursuing this GX Act. But if you step back, the previous Suga administration declared the 2050 carbon neutrality goal way back in October 2020. So, and well before the 2015 Paris Agreement, Japan hosted the COP3 back in 1997. And uh, Japan was very instrumental in establishing the uh, Kyoto Protocol, which was the first international treaty to set emission reduction targets. So the GX Act itself mainly focuses on you know, year 2030 and beyond in terms of achieving uh, hydrogen ammonia procurement goals, domestic battery production capability, increased renewable capacity, and also developing innovative thermal technologies. So I do believe this GX Act is greatly driven by Japan's long-term ambitions in reducing emissions and also realizing carbon neutrality by 2050. So uh, the GX Act will be really instrumental in helping Japan follow this path by establishing important milestones for Japan to achieve by 2030 and onward. Yeah, but I expect, I expect to a certain extent potentially sharpened a little bit as a focus on the security of the supply chains just more broadly in that long-term decarbonized context with regards to the kind of how, de- how dependent are you on one one supplier versus versus another etc but no i think it, 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 interesting in the japan has had a very much a long-term view on decarbonization for for for, for a while and that's been well signaled hey tell me i might i might come back just to, we, we touched briefly on there about the kind of mechanics of the supply chain subsidy there for hydrogen and ammonia that component of the bill with regards to how how it relates to kind of American hydrogen, for example. Can you maybe lay out for, for those of the audience that aren't won't be as familiar with the detail on this, just kind of exactly how that works? What do they what do they cover? What kind of IRRs and, and the things? What area and what areas of the act do you think it can strengthen in to accelerate things further in that transition for the for the green hydrogen and ammonia side? I know it's kind of open to to blue at this stage as, as well. Yeah, sure. And because it's quite a best book arrangement, so I can you know appreciate that it's actually not an easy one to understand at times. So just picking on the supply chain scheme. So first of all, who is eligible? It's suppliers of hydrogen and ammonia. You know, there could be traders or sort of captive users of hydrogen and, and ammonia. But the main goal of the scheme is to really target producers that will be supplying into Japan with Japanese off-takers. And the, having the off-take is a key criteria for this scheme. It's sort of a 
a, a condition for one of the sort of bid criteria that we we would expect to be included. In terms of the scope of what type of hydrogen is covered, both green and blue is eligible, gray to a very limited extent if in exceptional circumstances there's clear path to decarbonization. And then for the duration, the CFD scheme w- would operate for a particular project for at least 15 years, but could be extendable to 20 years. So this is one of the longest subsidy schemes that we see in the market globally. So just on the, on the CFD schemes, so I mentioned that there will be a bid price, which the, the bidders will say is this is the price that we you know can sell this green or blue hydrogen to you for. And that price will reflect the IRR, CapEx, and OPEX. So you have a sort of a, a profile of, that, of that, that, that product that allows the investors and their financiers to recover their investment. And then what you have is a reference price, which is the existing price of, of the product. And in Japan's case, and it, this is also a very bespoke element of it, in the case of hydrogen, the reference price will be gas price. And in the case of ammonia, the reference price will be coal price. And here I just kind of link back again to Japan's you know, focus on power generation. So it, if we're talking about coal firing, you know, to make to basically make coal and gas fire power plants greener, then then this linkage makes sense. But from the perspective of using hydrogen and ammonia in other contexts, this link makes less sense. So uh, what they're what the scheme is to, uh, sort of targeting is, you know, at the moment where we have coal and gas power inputs and where we have the pricing for that. If we were to replace that with hydrogen and ammonia, then what's the difference? And the government will cover that cost. Basically, that's how the, that the scheme will, will operate. But details are still to be worked out. And we're actually, you know, like many investors, we have discussed with some government agencies around how they see some of these elements working. And some of the challenging aspects will be around this focus on production costs, because the government is very focused on you know, what's the, how do we actually drive the, the, the production costs down and in doing, and also securing cleaner products. And in doing so, there will be some kind of a, a review mechanism. This is what they have signaled so far. And to ensure that the product is meeting green certification requirements, which may change over time. And we don't know, for example, how that change will be reflected. And the more sort of ability for the government to review things in the course of a 15 to 20 year investment, the more uncertainty this creates for investors and the more risk that it it creates for investor appetite. And so realistically, you know, end of the year, they'll come up with a package and announce the details of the criteria for auction to start next year. If the investors then decide that it is, you know, it does bring enough certainty in investment and and profit for them and their financiers, then they will go ahead. If not, you know, there there are other sort of schemes around the world that they might take advantage of. But coming back to what you were saying, Rowan, I mean, the Astro, the GX Act has been announced. We have been in touch with a number of clients actually who have um, almost sort of developed their off take strategy around the JX Act or have shifted in some cases. You know, we have some e-methanol startup company clients who have said, you know, that Japan is now interesting. Let's build a strategy around that. And some hydrogen ammonia clients elsewhere too. So it's a real focus. And I think there's a lot of attention on what's coming up towards the end of this year. Yeah, I think that is an important context there. Just with regards specifically to decarbonizing the power sector, as you say, in terms of those subsidies and, and the deltas, because it's a quantifiable price price delta, essentially. Hey, so I might pulse back to you here on that kind of broader context of the goal of this is, is cost parity to fossil fuels for the power sector. What are, what, what are you seeing on some of the work that Aurora has done on, on hydrogen costs at delivery in terms of the size of the subsidies it needs to be in? And, that long-term cost parity. That is, is it realistic that that hydrogen ammonia will get to cost parity with with fossil fuels over the long term? Are we talking 2030s or are we talking 2050, 2070 in terms of timeframes? 
So the Japanese government has a target delivered cost of hydrogen in 2050 of 220 yen per kilogram or 1.6 US dollar per kilo kilogram, which will be a point that will bring cost parity with fossil fuels. So we believe this is achievable with the amount of R&D going to the sector at the moment, but this really depends on cost reduction across production, conditioning, reconditioning, transport, electrolyzer capex, as well as increase in use case efficiency rates. And uh, there are also differences in hydrogen versus ammonia when thinking about cost parities. So perhaps we will see green ammonia being a front runner compared to green hydrogen in terms of cost parity because of not needing the reconditioning costs, the existing infrastructure that can already handle ammonia, and also a large offtake potential from the fertilizer industry. Fundamentally, though, cost parity has become less of an issue in Japan in the wake of the government's recently announced price cap support mechanism for the hygiene supply to Japan. So this is where the government will compensate the gap between supply costs of hydrogen by itself, natural gas for hydrogen, or coal for ammonia. So we believe this is a major signal of intent support by the Japanese government for the industry as a whole. And we are expecting this to unlock further infrastructure development and accelerate the cost decline, the parity with fossil fuels ahead of 2050. Yeah, and I, th I think that the, the context there, the projects that we typically see, whether it's ammonia or whether it's hydrogen, the projects kind of getting off the ground at the moment are typically the ones that have got the full supply chain lined up in terms of they've got an offtake that's, a, that's agreed. Whether or not they want ammonia or hydrogen is is kind of up to the offtaker, but they've they've got the full supply chain sorted and in a consortia and moving forwards. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to kind of dive into that in a bit more context, you know, be in the, and circle back to the Helios project we, we talked about at the beginning, because you've got a firsthand experience of putting one of these projects together for a project financing in, in Saudi Arabia. And, and Alan and Overy were a big part of acting on, on that. What were some of the kind of key features of, the, of, the, of that project? Yeah, sure. So it's exactly the point that, that you were discussing just now, the, 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 the structuring points that we help clients with in terms of actually getting to FID on these projects and we how we ensure that the structure is both investable and bankable. And often with sort of the first mover project, you know, you have all these challenges like technology, offtake, lack of market, lack of precedence, and offtake is a key piece of the of the puzzle. Another feature is what type of structure that you have, whether or not it's integrated or non-integrated. In the case of Helios, for example, it's a green hydrogen project. So there's the renewable project, which is also a new piece of infrastructure that's being built upstream, which is a project on its own. And, and then the hydrogen piece. And so the way that, that that project really sort of took a stride in getting to FID with project financing first, I think was, you know, simplicity in the structure. So by Master and Air Products really leading the structuring so that it's, it was an integrated structure as much as possible and, and backed by a very strong offtake arrangement with Air Products. And so creating sort of in the complex, in the complex sort of at new environment and new features of, of a new project, creating simplicity of it in, in terms of an investment structure will lead to certainty or more certainty in the future cash flow, which allows financiers and investors to come in. So that's what we that's what we try to do on the on the Helios project. And it's as I said, it's, it, it was great that we 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 did that one because it may not be a blueprint for all projects globally, but we now have a track record, and a lot of other investors will be encouraged by that, I'm sure. And there there is a lot of activity going on, not just in the Middle East, but but globally. No, it's incredibly interesting. I'd love to unpack, spend another 45 minutes unpacking that in, in even more detail, but we, we'd probably have to wrap up there, maybe with one final question. This is something we, we typically ask most guests on the, on, the, on the podcast. Who do you read or listen to in the Japan energy space that you think is always good, thought-provoking, kind of relevant to the, to the space? Yeah, so in such a fast-moving sector, I mean, things can just change every day. 
And I often, I use LinkedIn quite a lot. And actually I had Sun and I connected before, way before this podcast, thanks to LinkedIn as well. But just sort of listening to a lot of commentators on LinkedIn is quite interesting. Like in Australia, there's quite a lot of, of really active investors that, that post things. And so I, I read a number of them, including the Japanese investors. It's very diff- interesting to get their perspective, you know, and also chat to their colleagues in Japan as well. But the other thing, publication I wanted to just mention is that when I started looking at hydrogen deals, I came across it thanks to Tokyo Gas. So they have, and this is more for the Japanese listeners out there, they have a Japanese publication called LNG, 50 Years of Trajectory and Its Future. And that was really interesting to me. It's a record of how Tokyo Gas, along with other companies, pioneered the LNG industry. And there's a lot of comparisons that could be made between hydrogen and ammonia project supply chains and LNG supply chains. So I thought I'd recommend it to those that are interested. Oh, no, perfect. I've, I've just made a note of that. We'll definitely, we'll definitely check that, that particular one out. Thank you so much, Hitomi, for your, for your time today. We've covered a huge amount of content, but that was, a, that was an excellent, excellent overview. I'm fascinating to hear about the Helios Hydrogen project as well. We're incredibly appreciative of your time. So very much kind of all the best and and thank you so much again. Thank you so much. It's been fun talking to you, Rowan and Hayato-san and uh, looking forward to continuing this discussion at some point. Excellent. And thanks, thanks, Hayato, as well to you. Yes, thank you. That was Rowan von Spreckelsen, Aurora's Head of New Markets across APAC, talking to Hitomi Komachi, a partner at Allen & Overy's Tokyo office, and Hayato Ono, Aurora's Head of Advisory in Japan. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.